Welcome to LTTV Weekly, episode 14. I got in there before my co-host did in reminding me of the episode. But before we start anything, a little bit of housekeeping. Jordan, you didn't turn up last week. No, I, I thought a, uh, the show was a, uh, had enough in it in Kerry Goff. Um, I thought it was very emotional and, and a, um, I thought you did an amazing job, to be quite honest, Sam, in what was tough circumstances. I thought Kerry was amazingly brave and, and I didn't think we needed anything on the back of that. Um, I thought she spoke brilliantly. So I want to let's start there this week because obviously a couple of weeks ago now we announced what happened to Taylor. It's obviously been something that the club's been living with for the better part of two months. Um, from your point of view, I know I asked this to Kerry, but take me, take me back to that evening when you found out. Um, it was actually the Sunday night before we started back on, on the Monday, um, yeah. right back uh, in June. And, and um, obviously we heard, um, we heard the story and, you know, straight away, you just don't know exactly where you're at. Um, you try and find out as much information as possible, but it was a particularly serious crash. And, and um, you know, the, the initial reports were, were very bad. Um, we saw some pictures from social media of the car and, and it looked um, – it looked in a very, very bad way. It was difficult to believe that anyone could come out of a crash like that alive. Uh, so immediately our concerns were, um, you know, for Taylor and, and a, um, yeah, incredibly tough time, um, you know, coupled with everything that we've been through over the course, you know, this was thrown in as well. And, and um, you know, I think a lot of people deserve a huge amount of credit for the way that they've, they've handled the situation and none more so than, than Taylor's parents who have obviously been in the, in the toughest one. But thankfully now we, we, we've got a, um, some light at the end of the tunnel and, and um, you know, we, we, um, we have a Taylor functioning with us and who's just been moved to Sheffield. And, and a, uh, I suppose, you know, as we talked about tough times, breed tough people and, and Taylor is one of the toughest guys that I know. Uh, and uh, I said to his mother on, on a couple of occasions, you know, if anyone can get through this, I'm, I'm, I'm fully believe that Taylor can be that person. A bit of an update for anyone watching. Taylor had his feeding tube removed this week. So we are moving forward and ever closer to him getting some KFC again, which is his goal for the short term. Jordy, there are obviously guys who are very close to Taylor. Um, I'm not going to name them, but those guys that have come up the ranks with him, they're probably the guys that have felt this the most. Yeah, I think so. I think I think the whole club felt it, to be quite honest. Um, but obviously, his immediate peer group has um, has felt it. Um, guys who he spent day in and day out with, lived in the boarding house with, you know, his best friends. Obviously, you know, we wanted to look after them. We have a sports psychologist who who came in um, two days afterwards and and who you know spoke to the guys and, and offered gave gave them some coping tips. And, and we tried to be very supportive with that group. Um, you know, I think it's not just that group. I, I think some of the coaches who coached Taylor through up his on his pathway throughout the on his pathway through into the into the first team squad, they were particularly hard hit by it, as well as the medics. Um, so um, I think it hit everyone across the board in the club, and from the chairman down to a, uh, the groundsman, it was a um, it was a, a complete shock to us. But obviously, um, everyone got behind the situation, and everyone's talked about doing the right thing and supporting Taylor to the best of our ability. So um, obviously, a, uh, you know, it rings that. A line from Matt Hampson's book that Paul Kimmage wrote always echoes with me that I, um, in tough times like this, I, uh, you wouldn't want to be in any other place than in a, a Leicester Tigers a, uh, environment because we will support them. And, and I think, you know, we're obviously trying to do that to the best of our ability at the minute. And obviously, I mean, I keep saying, unsurprisingly, the Tigers family, the rugby family has come together and I think it's almost £40,000 has been raised. Look, it's not enough. Um, no. For me, we need, to, we need to go back at it um, because, um, you know, what we're facing at the minute is, is potentially life-changing injuries and we need to go back out there and, and, you know, something that we need to do over the course of the coming weeks is, is to try and uh, get that um, pot up because um, it's hugely important for Taylor's um, progressing to the next next stages and, and they, uh, something that obviously we as a club will, will have to drive as well as, as the players, you know, it's kind of beginning to plateau now. So I, I'm... I would implore anyone who has got um, a pound or two pounds spare to a uh, please donate. So that's obviously not the nicest way to start this week's episode, but there was some good news this week. Um, six, six additions to the club. Monday started with a bang with five additions and then you added one in response to some news down the line. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's always nice, you know, the fans for long enough have been asking, you know, who are we going to sign and when are we going to sign? So um, to add Luke Wallace to our ranks was um, was huge for us in, in that, you know, the way the game has gone and with the law changes in around the breakdown, we were looking for some EQP talent that, that really is aggressive over the ball. And, and we've got some guys who do that in our back row, but we felt that Luke gave us a bit of balance there. And um, we've had Guy Porter join us from uh, ACT in Australia. Uh, he's EQP um, and someone that we've had our eye on for a, a little while. Um, been particularly impressive in everything he's done in Australia so far. So um, he actually arrived this morning and, and obviously will be training with us over the course. Um, Kobus van Vick um, is a guy, again, who we admired as an outside back from his days in South Africa and made a big, brave move to move to New Zealand where he's been playing and has been pretty happy at the Hurricanes and scored some tries in the last few weeks. So that's something that we wanted to get across the line. And, and he will be here in, um, as soon as Rugby Eteroa finishes uh, in, a, in a few weeks. Um, Matthias Moroni is a, a player again, a, a 13, an net 13, who has played on the wing for Argentina, giving us that versatility, but I'm um, pretty excited about his ability to uh, beat defenders and, and he's, a, he's a quality all-round football. Uh, Kinney Murray-Murivalu, obviously a guy again, two clubs in France, Clermont and La Rochelle, um, both you know, top four sides. He's got a lot of experience. He's capt- captain Fiji at, at a couple of World Cups. Um, again, he's He's a uh, he's going to be a huge addition to our squad, particularly with the with the young back three players that we have. That little bit of experience just to 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 coach them through games and to to get, add experience to training sessions on a daily basis will be huge for us. And then a uh, Jasper Visa at the back end of the week was a guy who we um, had a eye on for quite a while. He's been impressive in his uh, ball carry and his toughness in the in the top fourteen when we've seen him play. So um, to get him done as well are a um, you know, it bolsters, bolsters the squad that we have, um, adds some some real steel to those ranks, and, and then, you know, it's exciting to have those guys in, in Tigers' colours. It might be a question for Jan, but from your point of view, obviously five guys exited the club a couple of weeks ago now. Are these all in response to those five, or were some of these, as you say, you've been admiring from afar, was it that you could pull the trigger now, or was it a case of they were in the planning no, so some of these were guys we were we were actually having a look at for quite a while. Um, some of it has been brought around by the the five departures, um, but you know we actually identified these guys as potential players for Tigers down the line um, a while ago. So um, you know with every a uh, door closing, another window opens. Um, so you know it gave us the opportunity to get some guys in, and, and um, you know I know all the guys from having spoken to them are very much excited about coming to to play at, at Tigers, and, and uh, we're looking forward to having them. Before I do ask you a little bit more about them and, and maybe the on the pitch, on the field stuff, I there was a sour note this week. Let's not hide from it. I have to ask you. Some comments emerged around pronouncing guys' names. And look, you've played with a lot of Pacific Islanders. There are Pacific Islanders at the club. Namani had his say. And I think it's important to note that Namani had a follow-up say the next day, basically saying, let's move on. I just wanted to have my say, of which he's entitled to. Um, Racism in sport has been a big thing. There's been, you know, players across the world in sports kneeling prior. There is the Black Lives Matter movement. Various things have gone on. But, Geordie, I'm going to ask you a very simple question, which is very layered. Is rugby a racist sport? Um, in no way do Leicester Tigers condone racism, I would say that. I think that's the, the easiest way to say it. I, th- I think uh, education is a huge piece because I think worldwide we're seeing that racism is inherent across all walks of lo- walks of life and, and people obviously need educating. I don't think there's badness in people, but sometimes that obviously is, is, is on the wrong side of it. I, I wasn't aware of the, the social media side of it or, or Namani's a, uh, um, conversation or, or whatever that was until you notified me. And I know you've spoken to Namani about it. Yep. As you say, he has to have, have his say. Um, for me, you know, as, as I said, at Leicester Tigers, we know we condone racism and, and you know we want to educate we want to make sure that people are, are aware of, of how that you know those negative comments affect people and, and the way that makes them feel you have had the opportunity to play alongside arguably some of the best pacific islanders to have played the game i want to ask you about what they bring to a club because it's more than what we see on the pitch they're incredible athletes incredible rugby players but as a whole pacific islanders bring so much don't they to your environment Oh, very much so. Um, it's very rare that you will see a Pacific Islander not smiling. Um, <laughs> great race of people really want to embrace life, really want to uh, um, enjoy themselves on the training field and off the training field. And, and certainly they're always the life and soul of, of a, uh, the changing room. Um, guys are a, uh, incredibly happy to be there. So, you know, as you, as you said, I've been very, very lucky to play um, some 
some of my career with some of the best in the world. And they, um, yeah, we're, we're aspiring to get more of those guys through into Tigers colours now. We live and we learn, eh? It's an education moment. We move on, as Namani said. So, uh, look, let's talk back to those guys. Guy Porter, you and I walked past him earlier today. Jordy, he is, um, he's a big boy. Yeah, he's not small. Um, he's not small. <laughs> he, he's certainly, um, you know, he's a young man. Uh, and as I said earlier, EQP uh, helps us. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think he was on a really bright path in Australia. So we're, we're very happy to have him at Tigers now. And um, he's not small. Um, he's a quality rugby player. And uh, I think he's one that may surprise a few people. You talked about, obviously, Luke and then Guy. Um, if we shoot to Jasper quickly, I had a chance to catch up with him and spoke to him. But straight talking, doesn't say a lot and gets his point across um, in a very short and sweet way, similar to another South African back row that's arrived recently. Yeah, look, he's, a, um, he's exactly what he says on the 10. You know, he, he's a man of a few words and, and uh, some big actions, and, and that's what we wanted. So, um you know, he won't be here for a little period of time until we can yeah. get him out of South Africa. But when he arrives, we'll get him up to speed. And, and um, yeah, it should be exciting, you know, with Kyle Brink on the field, with Hanro Liebenberg in, in, the, uh, in the squad as well. It gives him, us some versatility in the back row and gives us some real punch and real firepower there as well. Before we chat about Cobus and, and Kinney in particular and Mateus as well, there's a theme brewing in terms of the players coming in and there's a theme brewing in terms of these things behind me and I'll talk to you a little bit about them in a second as well, because we finally nailed down Justin Bieber to come on the show, which is very exciting. People will see what I mean in a second, but are we picking tough, big and somewhat crazy people? Is that the idea? No, um, no, 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 not just that. Not just that. Not just that. Um, Okay. But you you get what I mean. You get what I mean about it. Look, I think we need to have a a steelier edge to us. Tougher is something that we need to do. Um, Effort on the field is something that we're looking at in training. Um, Steve and Alan have been brought in to to guide the rugby program and we need bodies who are hugely competitive, scrap for everything, um, a real will to win. And and um, all of the guys who have been brought in have that to their character. Um, You know, it's exciting to to see what they can do on the field because, um, you know, no one likes to talk the talk before we walk the walk. But... um, yeah, um, I've been impressed by the way the players who are here have, have really taken to training. And, and, you know, when you get guys like that with that winning attitude, joining a club in, in an endeavour to, to make us that more competitive group, then it's a, a huge exciting. So just quick fire then. Kenny, what does he bring? Because you understand fullback and wing better than most who have played the game. What was it about him that went, that's the kind of guy we want in our 15 shirt or on the wing? An experienced leader who's got a little bit of X factor to his play. Um, nice kicking game. Um, he's tough. Um, he's passionate. He's a family man. He's got three young kids and, and he wants to get better. And everything we heard is that he's brilliant with, with the younger players that he's worked with and helps develop and grow younger guys coming through. Um, having spoken to him, he was hugely excited about uh, yeah, the potential of joining Tigers and playing in the UK. Um, so, um, yeah, I think he'll add all of those things. One of the nicest people I've ever spoken to as well. Honestly, just lovely, lovely. Unlike you. But that's um, fair. yeah, that's fair. Cobus, um, he's done some pretty impressive stuff over in New Zealand's version of the Super Rugby. He's another guy. He's, he's big, he's tough, but he can, he can find his way to the try line. Very much so. Um, you know, we flagged him up a, a little while ago, his ability to play 13 and wing, um, predominantly wing recently. Uh, big body. Um, works incredibly tough, finds his way to the try line. Uh, and a, um, again, a hugely impressive man. When we spoke to him, obviously, he a, uh, he's a, uh, had big decisions to move from New Zealand. And he's pretty happy there, but um, very religious man and, and a, a guy I think that would go down very well with our, with our fans. And finally, Maroney, um, not well known to a lot of people, but a guy who's carved out a pretty impressive career. He's a good player. He's a very good player. Um, exciting again. Um, you know, we've had some great Argentinian players here throughout our time. And, and uh, Marco Sierra was, was obviously the, the, the flag bearer, really. Um, but we've had some fantastic players, and, and particularly outside backs. And Horatio Guja, and, uh, Lucas Gonzalo Amorosino, two guys who um, were great characters around the, the squad. And, and they, uh, certainly Mateus uh, reminded me a little bit of uh, Rengo um, in his... Slight arrogance, I guess, um, just a confidence, and, and uh, I, I like the way he plays. I think he's going to bring a nice little edge to us. 
Did Thomas have any input? Because it looks like Thomas is just trying to get some friends. Yeah, Thomas is definitely. Obviously, don't tell him I said that because I'm really, really scared of him. But you, you should be. Um, no, Thomas is quite happy that we've we've signed some people. But Thomas is on a, a, a Spanish band, so he's got to keep speaking English. Yes. And they, he's you, doing you very well. He's doing, he's doing well. fantastic. He's, he's 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 getting better. When he arrived, he didn't have a huge amount of English, but I think now he's 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 comfortable, and we're going to get him to a uh, world class very short. Well, you made the fatal error of letting me greet him at the airport, so the first English he got was from me. Well, that's that silly. That probably, was silly. That was probably Look, a massive mistake. Yeah. In the second row there, alongside Thomas is Blake Enova, who's arrived. He's trained for a week. Um, another guy that look, we knew he was big. We've seen his height and weight on profile pictures, but he um, he's he's another one. There's some serious size building in that Tigers pack. Yeah, look, he's a big body. Um, obviously, we're really impressed with with Blake and, and the, the environment that he's come from, and we rate the Brumbies as, as a, a serious set piece team. And, and um, his expertise there is is a, a second to none. So um, we're excited about having him. Um, he's been slightly uh, jet lagged this week, so kind of been tripping himself into sessions. And, and but you know, should be ready to go uh, in the next in the coming weeks. And um, again, yeah, we're, we're uh, looking forward to having him out there. I've heard he's a bit of a line out noise. Can you confirm? Um, I believe his expertise is 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 hard. That's politically around, correct. Come on, is he in, a line out? In around the line out. No, no, he's you know look, we, we need that. We're lucky we've got some guys and some young guys in, in that position um, that we'll be able to learn from. Um, but I do believe he enjoys line outs, which will make the head coach very happy. Well, look, you know we've got one of the best in the world in, in driving that. So um, I'm not calling him that. Uh, Absolutely not calling him that on record. You call, what are you calling Steve at line at holes? <laughs> it's your words. I can clip this any way you want when I edit it. So that's fine. You just you keep saying the words. We do like a auto-tune version. Look, Jordy, you can have a quick tea break. I know you've got some coffee there, but the one thing I want to have a chat about in a second is these four behind me because I've subtly had them in everyone's face. They're on the kit. But here in an a LTTV Weekly exclusive, we've managed to get Justin Bieber to talk us through the values. Um, look, it's not Justin Bieber, it's Matt Johnson, who's the club's head of HR, but you'll understand what I mean when you take a look at this. So here, kick back, because this is incredibly interesting. Matt, this interview's probably been a long time coming. I think the fancy board behind you that's been pointed at on numerous episodes of LTTV or now appears on the kit has started to seep through to the Tigers family. Admittedly, you've probably had some things on over the last couple of months that have kept you away from appearing in front of a camera and obviously getting a haircut. So that had to be acknowledged early on. You did agree that I could could mention it. But look. Thanks. The reason I wanted to have a chat with you, you are obviously the head of HR. Um, you were the enforcing figure behind the values behind you. So... Rather than try and explain them to people, rather than people thinking it's necessary spin or PR or just something that people can read and think, oh yeah, beat the chest, less the Tigers. I wanted to ask you exactly what is the standard? So I'm going to do it a very simple way first. I'm going to ask you what club first is and I want you to explain it to me in something that I can think about. So what is club first? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, to be honest, I think actually out of the four of them, club first is the most easily misinterpreted. Uh, a lot of people will look at club first and think that basically what you're asking of Tigers people is you give up everything. You give up your personal life, you give up your, your family, your time off. You are basically Tigers 24 seven. If you're not working, what are you doing? Um, that's not what club first is about. Club first is it's more about a mindset and, and your approach to your actions and your decisions. So it's about the collective. The club is its people. Um, and the point of club first is that when you're making a decision within this environment, are you making that decision for the good of the guys and girls sat around you, or are you making the decision for the good of yourself? Um, it was felt that club first was very much a, a trait that, that we that we were when we were at our best and that we wanted to be going forwards. And I think if you take the, the, the recent um, issues around COVID and what that's kind of created for us as a club and some of the, some of the struggles that have been mentioned on some of your, your previous interviews, uh, you've got internally uh, 
staff and players right across the club all took a step forward and had their their, their salaries reduced by by 20 25 percent as of april 1st uh, a big a big kind of sacrifice from people for the good of everyone else the, the point was that we were trying to or we were entering into a fight for the survival of our club and people were willing to to make that sacrifice and and put the collective uh, at, at the forefront so i think that's probably one of the the, the better examples or more pressing examples I have of that at the moment. Similarly, you could you could say that that even extends outside of the club, um, especially when you're thinking about fans, uh, sponsors, partners, those those guys that have left money in the club yeah. rather than withdrawing that afterwards. Uh, again, for me, it's it's part of that kind of extended Tigers family. It's a club first mentality. Again, it's about the people. It's about that group. Like you say, there's a fight. One of the, I guess the next word, if we're moving down, I'll go in order, is tough. So tough Tigers, everyone hears it all the time. I know Geordie says it. One of Geordie's favourite sayings is, you know, tough times make tough people. That's the nice, again, maybe cliche, maybe nice quote that you can Google. But why is tough part of the Leicester Tigers standard and values? Yeah, I think... uh I think that's probably where the mind goes straight away when you think of tough. Tom Young. Yeah, exactly, the exactly. These guys on the uh, on the pitch, um, beating each other silly. Uh, that that kind of rough nature of the of the sport, I guess, uh, and that's the first thing which comes comes to mind. And I actually don't think that um, like it, it, it's not that it doesn't mean that. Uh, it's about embracing that that kind of hard edge of of Leicester Tigers that I think is probably part of our, our kind of our DNA. Um, but it's also again it comes back to how do you make this sort of thing apply off the rugby pitch as well. And I think for everybody, tough uh, is is very much around the types of decisions we make, the types of conversations we have. I think it's probably fair to say that as a club we've not been where we want to be or where we believe we should be for a very long time and for me the tough conversation to to have and the and the tough decisions to have have to be around the fact that we recognize that and we're very honest with why maybe we've not been where we want to be and how are we going to rectify that i think if you if you look at the pandemic um and everything that that's that's caused in relation to events at the club over over recent months the the salary reductions the having to place people on furlough the the redundancy process that we went through all of that has uh has it's been processes which have been tough to be involved in you've had to have difficult conversations with people who are good people um people that you know people that you speak to on a day-to-day basis, people that you'd sit next to in the office, and you're having to have really difficult, challenging conversations with those people about their livelihoods moving forwards as a result of this pandemic. Again, I think it's a, it's a, it's a horrible situation to, to be in, and, and tough probably underpins that. The next one is passionate, and look, I'm not picking apart it, but you would, uh, you could certainly not fault people for thinking why would anybody want to come and work at a professional sports environment if they're not passionate but in saying that it exists whether it's playing staffing ranks that is part of it there's no question so why is passionate on there when you think that should just be a given yeah i think you i I think you almost take it for granted in that respect Um, I don't know that I don't know that it necessarily always is a given. And yeah. to be honest, if that of the four of them, if that is uh, if that's the easiest one to achieve, then then great. But that doesn't make it any less important. We genuinely believe that if people really care about what they do and their part in the bigger picture, that is what will lead us towards high performance. That is what will take us to the next level. People have to really genuinely care about their contribution and how we get to where we want to be as a club. And then obviously driven. I mean, it is called the standard and many for years have said the standard in in rugby was Leicester Tigers. There was an element 
maybe of complacency that crept in in recent seasons. That's something Jordan has said, Tom Youngs has said. I'm not necessarily making a bold statement myself. I don't want to be pinned on that one, but I'm putting it on them just to shirk any responsibility. But Driven, which isn't on the shot of the camera, but people can see it obviously on the new kit, which I know you're very excited about. It's all there, but Driven. So again, you could argue for a professional sportsman or woman, Driven is part of their DNA. So why is it necessary to be there in lights at Leicester Tigers? Well, uh, to be honest, I think you've probably, uh, you've, you've probably touched on that a little bit there in, in your question in the first place. And I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't, again, be tough and, and recognise where we've been before and where we need to go. So I think it's probably fair to say that Leicester Tigers have been a really successful club in the past yeah. and there are potentially accusations that we've kind of lent on that too heavily. Yeah. Um, we, need to, we need to get away from that. We need to create our own new... Uh, history a bit of a cliche I guess but we, we need to we need to achieve that ourselves and the only way to do that is to continuously ask ourselves how can we be better how can we do this better than everybody else how can we look at our own standards just internally and try and beat that the next time uh, and I think if you apply that again right across the board not just the players and the coaches but right the way through the staff at Welford Road it will drive the whole business forward and I think that's what it's about. So that's that leads nicely into what I want to ask you about. I guess you could argue this doesn't necessarily need to be shared externally. This can be something that is on the walls at Welford Road or on the walls at Oval Park. And I know you've said before that this is not about a head coach or a director of rugby standing up and telling the boys these are our traits when we tackle or we run. This is something different. So why is it that you and the club felt it was necessary for this to be printed, posted up and talked about externally? Um, I, I think there's probably a few bits to to, to cover um, as, as part of that. I think the first thing that I'd, that I'd need to mention is that this, this isn't my piece of work, for example. This isn't Andrea's piece of work. Yeah. This is a collective. Yeah. Um, the, the process of getting to this point was a uh, was was through kind of wide consultation right across the club. That involved uh, senior players, um, junior players, it involved staff at Oval Park, staff at Wealth Road, all coming together and basically uh, uh, really testing and challenging each other on what we believed was important about being at Leicester Tigers and being a Tiger. Now that is how this was created and it was over a number of, uh, number of sessions, number of months with a lot of people um, we then boiled that information down to come up with something like this which reflected the, the general consensus. Um, I think the really important thing to to bear in mind with this as well is that again we don't see this as anything new. This, is, this, this isn't something where one person has come in like you mentioned the, the coach on day one of pre-season yeah. saying right we're going to be this today. Yeah. That's not what this was about. This was about us recognising what makes us us when we're at our very best uh, and and everybody contributed to get towards that so the idea of this and the idea of, um, uh, of broadcasting it uh, both internally and externally is that it's a reminder if we genuinely want to be where we want to be as a club this is what we need to live we need to live this every day so from your point of view obviously you have been at the club now for a number of years. Roughly 10. Yeah. Again, the Justin Bieber haircut makes you look much younger. But, but uh, so, so around a decade, HR is something you moved into about a year and a bit ago now, yep. about just over 12 months. Previously in sports science, firstly, personally, why that move? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, um, there's a question for you. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think from a from an external perspective, or, or anyone that, that probably doesn't know me, it would look like a very strange <laughs> career choice to having been based at Oval Park for the it best wasn't part. Wasn't an overnight decision either, was it? No, it not was at all. Long, no, yes, not 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 at all. Um, it was. Uh, I probably spent the best part of nine years here at Oval Park in a uh, a performance orientated role, I guess, supported from strength conditioning, sports science yeah. uh, basis. Uh, the reason I got into that was again because I'm I'm passionate about performance. I'm passionate about 
uh, about winning, about doing well. Um, and, and so being drawn into sport was kind of a bit of an obvious route for me, I felt at the time. Um, as I spent more time in a performance environment, the more I started to gain an appreciation for the fact that your people in general are what really define how good you are. Um, and I then started to question for myself, well, if that's genuinely my belief, if I believe that people are your ultimate performance variable, how in my seat can I best affect that? Um, which is why I felt that a, a change was was what I needed. Um, so I approached uh, I approached the club, um, I approached Geordie, Andrea, um, and, and basically said, look, I want to take a bit of a leap of faith here, but this is kind of my philosophy. This is what I believe in. I believe that if we, uh, if we invest in our people, um, and and we genuinely believe that it's that people are our ultimate performance variable, that's what will drive the club, the club forward. Fortunately for me, they, they decided to take a punt. So. They bought it all. They bought it all. No. Um. Uh, so, without again, pushing the friendship. I have my own personal relationship with HR. I have my whole working life. That's for other people. As you laugh and giggle, you know well and truly. Um, I'm the kind of person HR, I think, enjoys dealing with. You could say that, surely, surely. But no, on a serious You've got note, the microphone, mate, so yeah, sure. Whatever I want, really. But HR is something that worldwide is perceived as big presentations and people thinking, oh, no, I've got to do that once a month about... Health and safety the fun police. And, and all that. Yeah, they are the, the fun, fun police. police. Yeah. Is that, that doesn't sound like what you're telling me it is. There is obviously a lot of paperwork and again, I will fill out my forms eventually, I'm sure. But what is HR at a sports club and what is HR at Leicester Tigers? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, what is HR at a sports club in general? will vary massively yeah. and what I'm probably more concerned about is what I think HR should be at Leicester Tigers yeah. that's that's the important thing for me and you can't get away from the fact that yes there are compliance things that like it's the it's kind of the bread and butter of that function you can't get away from it um, but that's not what we want it to be in its entirety I think there's so much more that HR can contribute to in terms of facilitating all areas of the club, uh, both at Oval Park and Welford Road, to get the very best out of their people. So again, it all comes back to that kind of underlying belief about p performance being underpinned by people and, and and getting the most out of them. So I guess my my approach to that and what, what the club want the approach to be from HR is to assist us in firstly getting the very best people into the right seats in the first place to get the right people on the bus. Yeah. The next part is get those people really excited about what it is that they do and how that fits into the bigger picture of where we want to go as a club. And the last part of it is, well, let's provide them with the tools, the environment, the training that they need to become the best possible version of themselves. So I think if you've got the best people, you've got them really motivated and excited and you provide them with the environment that's going to help them excel, that's high performance right there. And that's what we want HR to underpin, not just filling out forms and paperwork. And health and safety talks with Dan Cole and Ellis Genge and Tom Youngs. On a, on a less light note, obviously the last hundred or so days for you has been incredibly difficult. There's no hiding from that. I think everyone's outlined that when they've spoken about it. You've been at the coal face of what you were saying was those tough conversations there's no positives in losing 31 people let's be blunt right that's that's the honest truth but there must be some things that you think the club and even if it's you or you know those that have left or even remain can take from this to become better to become tighter tougher more passionate more driven if that makes sense. Yeah, I think in terms of those the last kind of few months, I think if you consider kind of everything we've said about 
when we embarked on this just over a year ago, this this project around people, the last few months have felt very much against the grain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, almost, almost unnatural in that respect, yeah. because, again, had it not been for COVID, we would never have gone through a redundancy process. You're you want to focus on performance you want to focus on how can we be great but you're forced into a situation whereby you're having those difficult conversations with people that you know really well yeah. um that's that that's that's hard that's really hard and probably one of the hardest things i think i've career-wise ever had to do um and hopefully not one which yeah. will be repeated sure. um i think in terms of us as a club and and where this, the, these kind of recent times will, will take us is, I think it's probably brought everybody a lot closer together. Um, I think it's given everybody an, a, a real appreciation for how much we're willing as a collective to fight for this club and, and what it is that we want to achieve and where we want to get back to once this pandemic's all over. Um, and I think I think that's one of the biggest things, to be honest. I think it's if there is a positive to take from such a horrible situation, I think that it is that it will bring the rest of us very close together, a real tight knit group um, that are all on the same page uh, in, in terms of moving forwards and, and where the club wants to go. So obviously, fans are watching this predominantly, and but whose job is it now to drive this? You've said people need to believe it and, and live it and that's not enforced it's not a regime let's not you know you're not standing there with a big stick and people don't have to recite it in the morning with their hand on their heart but whose job is it to drive this i think it's all of our responsibilities again similar to 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 what i mentioned earlier on about how this was created like this is real nice it looks it looks it looks good but on its own or words on a wall they don't mean anything yeah. uh, it, it's what you do to live it so it's all of our responsibilities to do that we created this together we need to make sure that as individuals we're living to those standards so it won't be one person that's going around kind of checklist is everybody doing it it's, it's something that we have to drive as a group you don't have to be a manager to do that but you would be a leader I guess in that respect just on the fans point of view and i'm throwing back to one of the earlier points you made obviously there was a consultation process and it is people internally it's not as if you know was any of it built on traits you knew that wider tigers family do give and do show on a daily basis so like you mentioned fans and sponsors have you know stepped up through COVID. they've also been incredibly supportive through it you know and and We've said farewell to a lot of people over the period and, you know, planned and unplanned, admittedly. And we haven't been able to do the right thing by letting them walk around the pitch and say thank you. And But fans have been fantastic in that light. But what did you pick from those people that stand on the terrace or those people that have turned up for 20, 30 years and had a season ticket or, you know, stand by the tunnel when the boys run out over the cement, whatever it is, what did you take from them? I think uh, I think as part of the the consultations that we did internally, obviously there was a there was a lot of people involved in that who who interact with the fan base on a on a very regular basis, um, yeah. um, that, daily, daily. Um, and and that was kind of a great avenue for us to to get more of an insight, I guess, into into the fan base and the wider Tigers community. And actually, as part of that, we 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 incorporated within the wider piece of this work uh, what it was that we were looking to become as an organisation, where we wanted to be. And the, the general kind of strap line for that was that we wanted to create this, this unrivaled club environment. But coming back to your question, that unrivaled club environment, the, 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 the statement read that it was for our players, mm -hmm. it was for our staff, but it was actually also for our supporters. Yeah. Um, and, and we wanted that to be inclusive, which I guess comes back to the whole tiger's family type thing uh if you looked at these four values in the context of the leicester tigers fan base i don't think you could question no. any of them um again coming back to the example before uh 
people people follow tigers all over the place to on a regular basis to come and watch uh the the club is important to people uh so there's this club first in there tough these guys stick with the club through times where we're really where we want to be and times when we're not that's tough for me they're passionate they're driven they want us to be back at the top they want us to be back winning trophies straight to facebook thread it full time that's passion <laughs> exactly that's passion. exactly but that's the thing even the if people if the fan base didn't care if they weren't passionate yeah, they would. you wouldn't even get the messages that say no. you know what awesome. that's not good yeah. enough like they wouldn't care so I, I think all of those stand for the Tigers family the wider Tigers family not just who's internal to the club I actually used um, as part of the the internal presentations when we were feeding back this to, to all of the departments we gave examples of uh, how this wasn't anything new and how we already lived these when we were at our best um, that related to the players, that related to the staff. But I also used a tweet from uh, from one of the supporters as well, which uh, I can't remember the word, so forgive me for that, I can't remember the wording specifically off the top of my head, but it was essentially along the lines of there'd been a season ticket holder since the early 90s um, win or lose the club is the club to them and they will continue to support the club they will continue to back the club uh, through the highs and the lows I'm kind of paraphrasing the words a little bit there but that's essentially <laughs> what the tweet it does doesn't it um, <laughs> far more eloquent than anything I could write um, but but ultimately that was the that was the message and for me like it pretty much displays all four yeah. characteristics in a single tweet and that's from a that's from a fan that's from someone that hasn't been uh, hasn't had this kind of presented to them or anything. They just live it because it's who we are. So you you obviously oversee recruitment in terms of ticket office staff, marketing staff, everything. How much of this is part of what Jordan, Steve, and Jan McGinnity are looking at when they're looking at a player? I think it's I think it's something that we're that we're developing. So I think one of the things that that we need to be honest about is that we're not the finished article in that respect yet either um, we're working towards creating uh, c creating the processes that, that yeah. we think are going to be important and what we'll be looking to do is if we've kind of got our, our DNA of what a tiger would look like then how how do we incorporate that into the recruitment process in the first place how do we check that actually not only are they the person for us but are we the club for them? So, if you don't if you don't want to be those four things, mm -hmm. that's fine. That's not a problem. But we're probably not the right match. Yep. And I think that's where that then needs to be incorporated within any sort of recruitment, whether that is players, whether that is staff across the board. It needs to be very clear what people are walking into and what we stand for. So I'm going to put it on you now because these are all things that individuals, which include you in personally, but Professionally speaking, the club is asking or saying this is what we want. What is the club doing? Because I know it says the standard there, but I have seen something else that is called the contract, I think, which is not an official, no one's signing something, just to clear up. We're not, but you are HR, so that's fine. But it, from that point of view, what, what comes back the other way? Because as you say, there's, there's two sides to it. Yeah, yeah, and there definitely is. And that was actually, the, the contract is something that we use um, or are starting to use more internally uh, and it's I've just aired it externally sorry ah, no worries it's a bit harder I guess it's a bit harder to apply it externally in that respect because it was built for, for 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 the internal relationship I guess with with our staff yeah. but and players but ultimately the the point of it is that if I come to you and I say right Sam you've got to be club first you've got to be tough you've got to be passionate you've got to be driven what I'm asking you to do is basically give 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 yeah. I'm it's not a two-way thing it's not a reciprocal relationship and what we wanted to do was create this uh, this scenario whereby it is two-way people do get something back so the idea of if you're going to be club first and you're going to give all this stuff or how are we going to invest back in you as a person if you're going to be passionate and excited about about what it is that you do uh, and you're going to really put your heart into it how are we going to reward you for that it's those sorts of things. So the, the point of the contract is a back and forth. Um, and, and hopefully what that, that leads to is 
people within the environment that feel valued, that they get it, they understand why we want to do these yeah. things and why we want to uh, ask people to, to, to work in a certain way. Um, yeah, it's reciprocal. So finally, because I have to ask, of all the players, staff, coaches, director of rugby included, because I'd imagine he's tough, who's the hardest person that HR has to deal with? just because they're wildly inappropriate or they're... Don't say me. It's got nothing to do with me. That's me. That's brutal. Thanks for your time. I haven't said anything. <laughs> Jordy, Bieber on the show. Yeah, look, uh, I just want to, anybody who's watching to apologise for the state of his hair. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't apologise for the state of his hair. But No, we have to apologise for the state of his hair. He doesn't usually look like that. He usually is reasonably presentable, but unfortunately lockdown has been uh, particularly tough on him. Uh, he's been busy throughout, uh, and I feel bad because he looks horrific. Um, but he's promised me he's getting his hair cut tomorrow, so I'll, I'll apologise now. But look, he's, he's done a great job, Matt, um, in driving the, the bits and pieces that you know he talked about there and, and that are up on the sign behind you. And, and um, yeah, it's something that we needed to sort of draw a line in the sand and, and sort of drive going forward. And, and that's a, um, I think they're make good people, don't they? I think what, first and foremost, it's the first time ever I've not had the worst hair on a show, which is extremely exciting. Um, but one of the things that was really poignant for me, Jordy, was I asked him about how much of this now helps you guys look at the people you want in your squad. It's easy to pick out a marketing or a ticket officer or a community staff member with these kind of things. It's a little bit simpler. When you're looking at players, as MJ says, it's a process in works, but you've had pretty poignant remarks in all of the announcements around these new players about the kind of person they are, not just the player. So you are building something here with Steve, with Andrea, with Alad, with everyone, every single person. How much of this and how much of the person comes before necessarily the goal kicking accuracy, the line out throwing accuracy, the passing, the tackling, the running? Oh, look, it's all it's all enwrapped in the same thing. You know, we as a club uh, need to be on the same page. You know, if we start from the bottom, they're driven. You know, we want players who want to come and be better on a daily basis. We want players to come and learn, and we want players to get out on the field and to really drive the standards. And, you know, to hold each other accountable to those standards. You know, people have to be passionate. We want people to love representing Leicester Tigers. We want them to go out there and be on our team and know what it's about, you know, to represent Leicester and to compete like, you know, like your life depends on it and to show our fans what it means to the, them and, and, and to, you know, have our fans in behind a team is, is some of the, the best moments that guys will experience at Welford Road or any stadium when our fans are, are, are vocal and, and supporting the team. Um, it's you know life-changing experiences and you know we want guys to, to, to do that we want guys to experience that and the only way you do that is by you know putting it in on the field and, and they, in the training park before we get to the field so it's in something that Steve and Alad are, are driving very well along with the coaches at the moment um, toughness is is you know multifaceted you know people automatically assume the toughness is just about um, being the strongest or, or being the most physical toughness isn't always that toughness is just getting back up when you're knocked back down, being positive, driving forward, um, you know, regardless of what happens, staying the course and they are doing the right thing by the club and, and by your teammates. And, and that's, you know, hugely important for us. And that, you know, leads into club first, which is all about what we've said throughout the COVID experience is, you know, this is about Leicester Tigers being a force down the line. You know, it's the start of a journey. It's not, a silver bullet, the fact that we sign in six players or we appoint some fantastic coaches. We have to earn our respect going forward. We have to work through it. And, you know, we don't have a huge amount of respect at the minute. And that's galling to me. But going forward, we'll earn it. So this is week six or five of the return to training. And this has been a very deep and meaningful um interview you could say or episode of this series we've put together rugby wise Geordie five six weeks in where are the improvements you've seen on the pitch I mean, a strange kind of mini pre-season to be quite honest with you because the first three four weeks we weren't allowed to play rugby so you know we got a really great fitness base in and a lot of social distancing training when we went to stage two you know we've been able to do more but again been impacted by um by the 
uh, sort of criteria of you know ticking the, the the right boxes to get us through stage two. So you know we, we get tested COVID wise on a Monday, and you know we don't we do our distance socially distance training on a Monday, and when we get those results on a Tuesday, we can do a little bit more. But again, we have to be very careful about what we do. Um, but you know I think the effort. Um, the commitment from the players on the field has just been hugely noticeable. Um, the guys who are here want to be here. They've bought into the new Leicester Tigers. And, you know, there's a huge excitement around the group about opportunities going forward. And that's been, you know, great to be part of. Biggest improver over that period? Or are you not going to name anyone individually? Oh, look, it's very difficult to name anyone individually. I've been impressed by everyone. Um, you know, everyone's been committed and, and, and got stuck in. Um, from the most experienced seasoned internationals to uh, you know the year one academy graduates, um, they've all stuck at it very very well, and, and there's been some uh, huge moments from everyone on the training park. Uh, David Williams obviously joined the club on loan from Nottingham a couple of weeks ago. He'll be here for the remainder of the 2019-20 season. There's two more faces bouncing around, Geordie. They're not here on loan though. That's what I understand from what you said earlier today. Who are they? Yeah, so Rory Jennings and, and Andy Forsyth. Uh, well, Andy Forsyth is, is known to us. Obviously, he was on loan to us the last Foz. season. The Foz. The Foz was on loan to us last season from Coventry. And, and Rory Jennings is playing at Coventry as well. And we're very grateful that, you know, we've got some great relationships with the clubs around, some Coventry, Nottingham, and Till. And, and uh, uh, those guys have been over training with us. And uh, um, on the training park, they've really uh, um, been quite impressive. So, um you know, we're grateful to our, our partner clubs and the, and the guys who support us in that and, and a, uh, grateful to Foz and, and, and Rory to a, uh, to for, you know, being able to come out and, and give everything they can on a daily basis. Finally, three weeks in to the director of rugby role, is your hand less sore from having to just type director of rugby or write that at the bottom of emails and letters? Do you feel better now you've just got the one title? But in all, in all seriousness, how have you adapted or felt you settled into it? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's strange times. COVID has, has kind of hit everyone for six and we find ourselves in situations that um, I don't think anyone has found themselves in before. And one of the things that I pride myself on is, you know, being able to ask questions of people who have experienced things. And when I've rang experienced directors of rugby's and friends of mine who are in that role in, in different premiership clubs and across the world, um, we all came, seem to be sort of working our way through things as we go and feeling our way through the dark. Um, certainly the last couple of weeks have, have felt more like a rugby club. Um, you know, we're not pristine just yet, but we're getting there. And, and um, you know, I've been really impressed by the coaching group, the way they, you know, they've taken to a uh, stage two coaching and, and driving that forward. And they, uh, it's been, um, it's been, yeah, it's been good. It's been enjoyable. No, thanks for joining us this week. Because obviously last week you didn't turn up, which I've obviously had to speak to Gan about because you contracted and that kind of thing. But we'll see how we go. Um, I, I think if you remember, you said in one of the first episodes that I was contracted for 10 episodes. Yeah, I think we renegotiated, didn't we? No. So sorry. I just, I think we might have to change this to LTTV first, or I'm trying to wet my hand under. Someone actually asked me last week if this is real. It is real. I'd just like to point out, this is not a graphic that's inserted. Someone asked me the other day if it's real. It's real. Jordy, thanks for joining us. Um, have a lovely weekend. And what are we, two, three weeks away now from the season? Bring it on. Great weeks. Bring it on. Thank you, Jordan. See you, mate.